Hi, I'm Ian Lowe, Senior Manager Content Services based at Dolby in London. I'm joined today by a panel of producers and post-production staff who have worked on some of the leading Dolby Vision natural history shows produced to date. We're delighted to be joined today from production by Jeff Wilson from Silverback Films, who was one of the directors on the Netflix series Our Planet, and Tom Hugh Jones, Creative Director, Natural History at Plimsoll Productions, who have just completed the Apple TV Plus show, Tiny Worlds. Do you want to introduce yourselves, who you are, and what role you had in making Dolby Vision projects to date? Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Jeff Wilson, and uh, I've worked in the last five years across two projects, uh, taken on the Dolby Vision uh, sort of uh, post-production and pre-production workflow. So the first was the Our Planet project for Netflix, uh, which started in 2015 and the uh and the second was disney nature's penguins which also was a, a recent uh a recent addition to the silverbacks uh, output uh and so both of those though both of those went through the whole dolby vision post-production uh workflow uh but was it was certainly something that we considered right from the beginning of, of pre-production as well Hi, my name is Tom Hugh Jones. I'm the creative director of Natural History at Plimsoll Productions. And over the last couple of years, we've been making content for Netflix and Apple, both of whom use Dolby Vision, uh, perhaps most notably Night on Earth and now Tiny World that's coming out uh, this Friday. So, um, so Jeff, you mentioned about HDR and Dolby Vision as being something you started right at the sort of pre-production stage. How did how did you and the team at Silverback first hear about HDR and Dolby Vision? We, as a team, all came from, uh, or most of us came from a background where we worked on series like Planet Earth and Frozen Planet at the BBC. Um, and we came from a, a background where HD in that, at, that, at that time um, was, was the pioneering technology that was going to drive forward the picture quality and the viewer experience in, in those series. Um, and it was funny when we went through those, that process, um, it was such an early inception that we, that we adopted that technology that most of us who are working on the coalface saw nothing of the hd until we'd finished even i mean even grading i don't think we even did an hd grade i think we it got mastered in hd we did an sd grade and then we 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 uh, eventually saw it on some fancy screen at the bbc um you know five months after we'd we'd finished post-production and um so I think the lesson really from that, from all of us who were part of that experience, because the HD experience was a, was an amazing one you once, you once you eventually got to see it. And it sounds it makes myself and Tom probably sound and look quite old, but it was pretty it was pretty amazing at that point. And um, so I think so the lesson from that really was is that um, all of those, you know, uh, yeah, pixel counting nerds that we love and we work with all the time, you know, who are banging our, on our door saying, you've got to see this, you've got to see this. When they come to you and they say, we've just been to a trade fair and we've been seeing it, these these HDR technologies roll out. And we've seen these HDR screens um, at, at various trade fairs and you've got to have a look. Um, simultaneously to the same time that the camera manufacturers are coming to us and, you know, that the, the uh, the side of the industry that Tom and I both work in is, you know, cam people who design and make cameras do come to us as natural history filmmakers and say, we'd like you to kind of adopt this technology because what you guys are doing are at the, is at the very forefront of where we'd like to be. You're dealing with non-controlled circumstances. You're dealing with, you know, light ranges that are way beyond what people would uh, sanely create in a studio so um you know those those we were very lucky in that people actually come to us with these things and say hey how about this we think it could really work and so that that's pretty much what happened at the beginning of the our planet project is a combination of trade fairs and and camera technology uh nerds and pixel counting nerds all kind of you know come to come to you right at the beginning and an association with netflix obviously which is important yep. and all you know all of those people who you know you very quickly learn in our industries that if there are people who are very uh more informed than you then you should probably listen to them and all of those people tend to be a lot more informed than me as a filmmaker so i do we you know that's what we do we listen to them and see 
what's happening. And that's that's how I first came across HDR stuff. Anything else, Tom? Uh, well, I was just going to add that I think the first time I came across HDR as a concept was on Planet Earth 2. And uh, about halfway through, we were told we were going to make an HDR version. And it felt like it came at a time after all the kind of, you know, the resolution wars and also the relative flop of three, 3D television. And, and it came as, as something that people are saying, well, if you really want to see a difference in image quality, it's not just about resolution. It's about your dynamic range. And I think, you know, going back to HD, that's something that, you know, we were very aware of on HD because I believe the dynamic range on HD is worse than that that we were shooting on film. So suddenly it felt like we could have all the benefits of shooting or shooting kind of without film stock uh, and be able to shoot with pre-roll and all those kind of things, but also get these images that were approaching more filmic images. So it seemed like a, a pretty good idea to me. And, and obviously we discussed about uh, uh, Planet Earth and those the switch from film to, to sort of um, HD. Did you shoot them with dynamic range in mind? Uh, I remember the cameramen uh, back in the day uh, kind of doing a film to HD uh, almost a transfer course did did some of the, the the cameramen kind of have to go away and experiment what hdr was or the dynamic range side of things or is it just using their art that they would have done anyway before when we did adopt hd we really did have to shoot differently you know i can remember seeing rushes coming back from planet earth where you know the whites were blown out and, and luckily we worked with our colleague mark linfield who was so on the case i think he he got the best possible uh, image you could out of HD cameras, but but it was limiting, um, and we would have to do things like really think about I don't know, yeah, shooting in those high contrast situations, things that you could have got away with film. So suddenly, I think it was almost a bit like going back to the olden days, you know, a and then some as well with with you know true HDR, being able to shoot I know for example shoot an animal up in a tree without doing a double exposure or, or shoot a a time lapse in a cave and not have to expose that you know do a double exposure so i think it was quite liberating actually yes yeah it comes it comes in two flows doesn't it, it there's there's um giving uh your camera people and your directors uh the creative instructions as to what they can possibly achieve but also uh giving them the confidence of what they can achieve in an, in, in a situation where they're not in control of the elements you know, and, and I think there was a lot of what we did in the design of uh, our planet right at the beginning at looking at how, you know, having a high dynamic range allowed you to to push the envelope in terms of blacks and, and, and whites at the two ends of the of the dynamic range scale. Um, so if, for instance, you're filming in a forest um, and, you know, typically as a camera person, you're you're fighting highlights that are bouncing off leaves, you know, that have these great big white spots and your animal is a chimpanzee and it's dark and it's in the shadows. You know, that's something that is just every image maker's nightmare. Um, and, you know, but when you start doing the test pre-shooting, you can start talking to people about just having the confidence of allowing um, them to concentrate on the thing that we're there to do, which is capture behavior and knowing that the image could stand up to what we were putting it through in most circumstances. Did you use a, a specific type of camera or are you using a, a range of cameras as the sort of main camera? It tended to be that people fell into the red or ARRI camp. Uh, we, we, ha we were working with camera people who shot across both platforms. So those tended to be the, the standard back then. Um, I think because of the the foibles of wildlife shooting and the the advantages of high speed and pre roll, people have tended to go down the the um, the red route at the moment. Um, but I, both both are equally good or, or <laughs> good in different ways. Um, so those really were the two main cameras I'd say for us. I don't know about you, Jeff. You used Sony for a while, didn't you? Yeah, we did. You know, we worked. I've worked on projects where we've used the F65, um, you know, almost exclusively, which has an amazing dynamic range yeah. and designed, you know, for really for very high quality studio design. And it's completely not designed for wildlife filming at all. And in fact, all of those, all of us who worked with the F65 are crippled for the for the um, fact that we had to carry those bloody things around a forest for two years. 
Um, so, but that was a that was a camera chosen by, as Tom says, the the guru in our industry, Mark Limfield, really as something that could deliver in a forest with a high dynamic range. Um, but I think all wildlife filmmakers will recognise that that the it's sort of horses for courses when it comes to tools that you use in um, in in wildlife films and obviously uh, there's a balance between pixel count and dynamic range that is always uh, part of what your delivery to your client is um, but the reality is is that you know you choose the best camera for the for the circumstance and um, I think the really surprising thing to me came is that uh, in in several circumstances where uh, we didn't believe that the difference in image quality would be noticeable in HDR post production. Actually, shone through on cameras that you would, you know, you wouldn't put up against a Red or a Sony or anything like that. But then once, um, you know, the guys in the post production workflow and the using uh, the base light as this piece of software to kind of really draw out that the the amount of information that's in both ends of your dynamic range scale it's surprising what cameras do actually deliver really 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 well and so i think we'll go on to talk about this but um that was one of my big takeaways from the r planet um experience was that there were cameras in there that were prosumer cameras and that can definitely deliver on an hdr post-production timeline for sure yeah yeah i mean for, for us it's it's a bit of why wouldn't you i think you know i think the hit you're taking for the benefits are, are, are relatively small and so much of what we shoot is backlit and on hd cameras when we're shooting back you know it's like do you want to expose for the for the highlights and have the subject completely black or, or do you want to be able to see both and with hdr you you can do that i think you know with with natural history we're, we're trying to show the beauty of the real world and and being able to show that more how the eye sees it is always going to be a benefit. And to your average person, they might not pick up on the nuances, but we spend years and years making of these films, struggling over those little tiny kind of differences. And it's all those little image quality uh, decisions you make to make it that much better, which makes the overall package that much more beautiful. And I don't know whether your average punt would be able to say, oh, it's because I can see that highlight or that, but they, they will be looking at image and go, it just feels so alive and real, which is what you want. Yeah, I mean, to, to that point, Tom, uh, a friend of mine um, was who, who doesn't have an HDR television, I know that. He doesn't have a 4K TV. He's just got an HD TV. He kind of watched, um, I think, the first three episodes of, of, of Jeff's show, Our Planet, and, and took to social media going, oh my God, I've watched three episodes. This is stunning. I've never seen anything of this quality before. And he's and he's watching the SDR version. So yeah. not even HDR. And he could see that the, the efforts that the team had put into it, which I think is, which is, which I think is just, uh, you know, a great, a great thing that, as you say, the average viewer who doesn't know any of the technology is seeing a difference uh, from that workflow. Because I wanted my children to see, you know, what I was seeing in HDR. I went out and bought an HDR television just so that they could see some of the things that I thought were just remarkable that came out of that, you know, that process. The one that really sticks in my mind, um, I was the, the film that I made in the in the Our Planet series is the Forest Program, the the, the one and the last one in the series, and. The, um, the we 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 had these images that came from a, a, a snowy uh, Canadian forest in the middle of winter, which were done on an Inspire Two with an X7 camera on it, right? And, and spec wise, uh, an Inspire Two, you know, it doesn't stand up against a Red in terms of its uh, a dynamic range and its pixel count, but um, uh, the when we took that through the HDR workflow, um, you were looking at an SD, SD image, SDR image, and then the HDR image on the separate screen was showing that there was these ice crystals in the air that were sparkling um, that you absolutely could not see in the SDR version, that in the HDR version, suddenly like somebody had sprinkled fairy dust over the entire Canadian Arctic, and it was there, and it was sparkling, and it was different colours, and it was just so staggering that that literally made me sort of say, right, okay, my boys have to kind of see 
you know that um that you know disney's frozen actually exists in real life out there you know and uh, we need to be able to show them I, i've made two films in cities first for planet earth which wasn't dolby vision but it was hdr and then the night on earth in the city and you're you're dealing with kind of bright lights and then dark dark shadows and and seeing that graded in hdr is like a completely different experience and it, it, it was it was truly beautiful actually and um you know, at first, it, you have to kind of get used to it a bit, don't you? After you've, if you've watched a standard H, standard DR, then 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 your eyes it, it's it's almost quite it's slightly vivid and it feels unusual. But um, I felt in those two episodes, especially during the night time, it, it it really came to life. When you have uh, an image that has a huge dynamic range and it has a large uh, is is in a high resolution. As a, as a camera person and as a filmmaker, you can take a static image and make it every bit as exciting as any moving image, um, simply because of the level of detail and the way that your eye scans the screen and scans the image. And I saw that a lot in the what we did on the forest program of our planet is that once I started seeing the, 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 the possibilities that the HDR, um, or that you know you being able to use a high dynamic range in an image gave you i started instructing people don't you know let's not move the camera let's just let's create a really beautiful static landscape as a gv and let's just run it 30 seconds 45 seconds because if there's snow falling in it or if there's butterflies in the background and the foreground and a little bee buzzing in the you know in the foreground and you've got layers and depths what that allows you to do is that there's so much information in there that your eye can scan it for easily 30 seconds and still find new things within that image. And you don't need to be moving the camera to make that amazing. And to me, that is essential in putting in removing the barrier between, you know, the viewer and the environment. It's kind of trying to pretend that there's no screen in between who someone sitting on their sofa and you know what they are uh you know and the the romanian you know deciduous forest that you're trying to say is the one of the most beautiful places on earth and if you can achieve that through the level of detail then you know you've you've absolutely won in my view and, and in terms of people that aren't as learned as you um <laughs> uh, you know people from from netflix or itunes or or, uh, or or some directors that maybe don't have as much experience or background when they first came in and saw those sort of HDR images in the grading suite or, or as finished kind of review copies, did, did you get similar reactions back from them in terms of, uh, of their kind of first look at this, this new, uh, new HDR yeah, world? I think, so. I, th I think more so than, you know, as discussed, more so than when 4K came out or, you know, that some of these things, I think to your average punter, felt a bit Emperor's New Clothesy, whereas I, I think it really is one of those things where, you know, generally people go, wow, it looks so real, it looks so sharp, and as Jeff says, it's it's like looking through a window, <laughs> yeah, like the natural world is through that window, ra rather than it's um, rather than it's kind of, you know, got this kind of sheen over it, which makes me know I'm watching telly. Um, so, yeah, I honestly, I, I, I think it really has been probably the most significant change in the last few years, uh, along with the benefits of shooting high resolution. You know, for me, the thing is, is when you have insiders, you know, in the industry and they're, they're, wildlife filmmaking is fill, filled with people with plenty of experience and who are very world weary. And to put them into a room and show them an image that they may have seen a dozen times already because they've been around the planet 17,000 times, you know, in their lifetime and show them how amazing it looks. And for them to say, wow, you know, that's those are the plaudits that you know, I don't know about Tom, but for me personally, are the ones that you, you look forward to is the industry insiders who kind of go, wow, that does actually look better. And that and that breeds confidence in what we're able to achieve as teams, you know, marching yeah. into, a, into a forest with a camera on your shoulder, you know, then suddenly you feel, you know, like you're, you've got a fighting chance of filming the, the behavior that you want to film in a way that makes you proud of the way it looks. So, so you mentioned um, earlier about your sort of ice crystals as being a, a moment where you suddenly saw something that you kind of hadn't seen there before. Were yeah. there other instances, maybe in the shadows, where suddenly something was there and it was like, well, it, we can have that in the picture? Because dynamic range isn't just about the sort of top end, it's, it's the bottom end as well, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, I can think of one which is kind of similar to what Tom's experience was with 
um, being involved in cities, but my team's worked a lot uh, in Chernobyl um, in the, the nuclear fallout zone. And um, Chernobyl, aside from being an, a, a, an absolutely crazy and amazing ecological success story, um, is uh, uh, as well as being a you know a disaster on a of, of human making on a on a really tragic scale well, when you're there as an image maker it's like an image maker's paradise um you know there are there are in fantastic images to be had everywhere and and you can tell a multitude of different stories but you're dealing in buildings with you know that are that are, haven't been lived in for 40 years there's really dark shadows in the corners but in the you know in the center of your frame you might have stained glass windows you can you can just see that 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 dynamic range is about as extensive as you can get but you want people to be able to see the broken shards of glass in the foreground in the shadow to get a context of why there is destruction as well as beauty in the stained glass window behind as well as forest behind the stained glass window that's coming through and so you know that's where the technology really shines is that you can it's not just it's not it's not just um being able to see the full image it's also being able to tell a story that says broken glass in foreground stained glass window which was the you know the utopia that, that the ukrainians and the russians tried to design and then the forest you know evolve um recovering in the background post-human habitation so there, there's a perfect example really in my mind of of where that technology allows you to story tell within a single image for, for me you know night on earth was, was the perfect perfect demonstration of being able to play in the shadows you know we, we didn't want to kind of make it feel like it was daytime we wanted it to still feel like night but a bit like when you know when you first step into a, a dark scene at night yourself at first it's just really black and then as your eyes get accustomed you start to pick out the kind of very subtle differences in the shadows um hdr really allowed that to be possible on night on earth so you can create these very subtle still feels like nighttime it doesn't feel like you're kind of just pumping up the gain but you can get a kind of very nuanced picture with all the different details and you can just distinguish this kind of dark cat from the shadow it's within. So it, it was, yeah, unbelievably powerful in that. And, and did you have to fight the uh, the sort of Martian colour type environment where people people have this view of HDR as being bright and colourful and, and, and obviously natural? Natural history has should look as it is uh, and the colour palette potentially allows you to go a little bit more than you perhaps normally see in a in a um, in a natural environment, or did you just keep it really kind of constrained and, and and as you felt it should be when you were there shooting it? I think you always want to make things look as best as they can, but within the realms of believability. You know, I, I think I think I, I guess so much of what you see with your own eyes is open to interpretation from your brain of, of you know how you feel what your emotions are and and so we want to portray the natural world in its best possible light our job is not to sell technology our job is to sell the natural world you know and so you know it's absolutely crucial that we give people uh, um, the experience which is representative of of the natural world the one thing that um it is kind of key from a Dolby perspective is that the HDR uh, is the master grade and then we do this Dolby Vision analysis and a trim down to down to a sort of SDR version. In terms of these shows if, if you were making a normal uh, natural history documentary does making it H in HDR and delivering it in Dolby Vision add a massive amount of extra costs or um, well, obviously, they, I mean, there's inherent costs in, in being able to or having to do two different versions, you know, I mean, um, but that's the, I don't think you can escape that. That's the world that we live in. I mean, we, t Tom and I, everything that we deliver gets reversioned in umpteen different ways, both in sound and, and in picture, you know, so it's not like you can avoid that. Um, did, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, because you have a lot of, things to deal with the amount of uh, money and time that you put into your base light grade uh, it, you know will reflect in what the picture looks like in the end and that's not specific to hdr that's just that's just the grade process right so yeah. um, 
you know, it's really down to the creative vision of the of the filmmakers and the series producers and the client to to kind of decide how valuable that is to their end product. Um, and 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 in and that obviously is a discussion that happens at the inception of a project rather than at the end, because you know we have to keep a certain amount of budget aside to get us through to the to the end vision of the of the of the product. I suppose the decision if you're uh, if you're a, more of a lone filmmaker or you're trying to scrabble together money to make your passion project and then you're looking at the costs. I, I don't know. I think I, I to be honest, I don't know exactly how much of a hit you're taking. And I think it's you have to decide what what the selling point of your film is. You know, if if a big part of it is to convey the beauty of nature and the beauty of the imagery of nature, then I would say it's probably a hit worth taking. If it's more of a documentary following a compelling story, that kind of thing, then, then maybe maybe it's not so important. But if you have aspirations for your wildlife film to kind of make it big and to be shown on some of these platforms, even if it's being picked up later, I would say it was a pretty sensible idea to consider doing an HDR. It's it's probably as important as, you know, people choose aspect ratios, you know, as to the best way to frame the film that they're they're telling, right? And, you know, you choose a two, four, nine or a four by three, depending on, you know, what the creative ambition of the film is and, you know, where your images are going to sit in that frame. And I'd say if you're, you know, if you're thinking at the inception of a project about those kind of things, then you should also be thinking you know, at, uh, you know, about HDR as a tool that is equal to, you know, um, aspect ratio, you know, just as a comparison. Would you do anything differently with all this in hindsight or has it all been kind of planned and executed well? And I, you know, no, I mean, it, it, in answer to your question, has it been planned and executed well? Rarely, you know, we're always... We, we, <laughs> I mean, it depends on what your level of perfection is, um, but we all learn, don't we, um, throughout the process and things come up, you know. I, I would love at the inception of a project to have every person that we are feasibly able to employ as a camera uh, operator to be sitting in a room and to have a look at an HDR uh, versus an, S, you know, an SD image. I'd love for the camera talent to, to be more involved in the grade. I think it would make a big difference. And, and so, so if you were a, an independent filmmaker, some of our audience today to this webinar, kind of what advice would you give them about about thinking about their new shows? Should they should they definitely think about HDR? Is it going to future proof their content for a longer period of time? Is it going to go to be potentially on offer to the different uh, uh, different companies who may want to buy their film and and, and show it? I mean, I think obviously, you know, with the clients that Tom and I work for, there it is a requirement on many things that they do, and so you definitely need to address it if that's your, if if that's your ambition is to put it onto one of those streaming services or one of the major clients, then you need to address it early on um, and um, and be aware of it. Um, I would I would warn against anybody future proofing, trying to future proof their film. Um, you know, because the the industries were always moving very quickly. I mean, obviously, I I, I like HD. I don't think that we're going to roll back on HDR. I don't believe that because I think the product actually is a very very good one and a very you know groundbreaking one. Um, but um, in terms of in terms of addressing it as an independent filmmaker, I think you need to consume some of the material that's out there as HDR, recognize whether it's important to you or not. And um, and and then also what else is important to you? Do you need to make money out of your film? Are you going to be having trying to sell it to a client? What is their requirements? You know, those are the things that all filmmakers have to go through. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it it is just about getting exposure to you know to, to to the product and and seeing how important it is to your creative vision. But certainly, when we're talking about the natural world, I would I would say any in in the natural world sphere, any wildlife filmmaker who wants the natural world to be the best experience possible for their audience, bearing in mind that they're watching it through a screen, then I think the tool is a really good one and one that you should think about seriously. Yeah, I think it's about you know. No, knowing your subject matter and then knowing your clients and, and if either of them <laughs> demand 
that you use HDR, you should definitely consider it. And if you if you haven't used it in in the past, I mean, I expect most people who are interested in wildlife cinematography will be familiar with it. But if you haven't, it's it's definitely worth experimenting with because I think some of the decisions you would have been forced into of where and when and how you can shoot have suddenly opened up. So it, it's very freeing. And you know, and and it is that, and the, it actually it talking about forests and at the beginning of this process it talked about how things like filming chimpanzees or gorillas you know the the creative ambitions of what you're able to do and with tom's you know night on earth that that again showed the creative ambitions of what's possible you know it doesn't need to be a um if you're not interested in technology or you're not a pixel counting or a a stop counting nerd it doesn't need you don't need to get into it in that depth you just need to be able to see if there drives a, a story within your mind that actually you thought was never possible to tell. And there are instances where that's, that, that is the case. Thanks, Jeff and Tom, for your insight. Thanks very much.